All right, Matthew chapter number 12. And uh, we got down through verse 32 and the unpardonable sin there. Let's read verse 31. Wherefore I say unto you, all manner of sin and blaspheme shall be forgiven unto men, but the blaspheme against the Holy Ghost shall not be forgiven unto men. And whosoever speaketh the word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. But whosoever speaketh against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven him, neither in this world, neither in the world to come. And uh, we look down through there, and that issue there of the blaspheming of the Holy Spirit is the unpardonable sin here. And it is a speaking sin, blaspheme to speak evil against. And uh, there we looked again, we looked at some things about the Apostle Paul, if I remember right. And the fact is, really the question comes up in some of that conversation is, did Paul really blaspheme God the Holy Spirit? And that's really the question there, because what happens is, is people forget that Paul was an Israelite. He was a Pharisee of the Pharisees. Uh, he, he is sitting here, uh, come over to Mark 3. I know we looked at this last time. I'm just look at it again here. You know, if you think about who the Apostle Paul was as Saul of Tarsus, he was an Israelite, and as an Israelite, he uh, had hope. Um, he had a hope in God. He had a hope in what was going on, but yet when he blasphemed against the Holy Spirit, then he lost his hope. He lost his nation. His nation lost it. So the 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 and again the the passage in Matthew twelve there t just clearly says that you don't have any hope in the world if you speak against the Holy Spirit. You got no hope now. Can't be forgiven now, nor in the ages to come. And, and so you know, <laughs> there's some things in there. Now, the but now, right now, the dispensation of great, completely different, okay? has nothing to do with, I mean, you can speak against all three, and it doesn't matter. It isn't going to nail you, because he's dealt with that. So, but back here in time past, the Lord Jesus in his earthly ministry, and again, Christ, we know it's a, it's a speaking sin. We know it was not geared for Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Because the Lord hangs on, on Calvary and says, Father, forgive them, for they know what, not what they do. We know that the sin isn't in the body of Christ, because he changed the program in order to save Paul, Saul of Tarsus, put him in the body as the first one. So when you think about what he's talking about here, about, hey, if you speak against, blaspheme against, it won't be forgiven you. Notice, if you will, in Mark 3, in Mark 3, and, and again, I know we read this the other day, verse 27, Mark 3, 27. I know we read this last time, but I just want you to see what is being said here. Uh, Mark 3 and verse 27, No man can enter into a strong man's house and spoil his goods, except he will first bind the strong man, and then he will spoil the house. Verily I say unto you, all sin shall be sin shall be forgiven unto the sons of men, and blasphemes where, wherewith soever they shall blaspheme. But he that blaspheme against the Holy Ghost hath neither forgiveness, but is in danger of eternal damnation, because they said he hath an unclean spirit. So the blaspheme against the Holy Spirit is to say that the person bearing the testimony of the Holy Spirit has what? An unclean spirit. The blaspheme against Christ is forgiven. But now there's going to be, come over to Acts 7. We saw this. Acts 2. Come to 2. But now... In the little time period in between the ascension and the interruption of by in Acts 7, you've got a time period in there where Christ has ascended into heaven, but before he leaves, he sets the apostles up to bear witness, to be his witnesses 
but then to also bear the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Acts 2, verse 1, And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all in one accord in one place. Verse 4, And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. You see, the Holy Spirit's witnesses witness now through, through them. See, through that little flock, through the apostles. Now they're going to go out now, come on over to Acts 7. They're going to come out now and they're going to start working, Acts 7, verse 51. And they're going to be doing the, the, the work and the ministry of the Holy Spirit. And he sits in that little flock. And when they blaspheme against that issue, there, there's no hope. Now they're in violation of Matthew 12. Acts 7, verse 51 now, I want you to understand how it is that they blasphemed against the Holy Ghost here. 751. Ye stiff-necked and uncircumcised and hearts and ears, ye do always resist the Holy Ghost. As your fathers did, so do ye. Now, notice they are resisting the testimony of the Spirit of God just like their fathers did. Okay? So then it's like, okay, how'd their fathers do it? We'll come back to Nehemiah. Did we look at Nehemiah last time? No. Nehemiah chapter 9. I didn't. I couldn't remember if we did this. We were running down through in Nehemiah 9. Nehemiah 9. And look, if you will. Let's see if I got, make sure we're running here. See, they're asking if I'm on tonight, but I am. I kept my, I did something I hardly do, and I kept my phone up here. I never do. And I got text messages, hey, are you on tonight? And Yeah, well... We're recording it, so somebody will see it, and we'll get it up there. Nehemiah 9, verse number 30. Yet many years, Nehemiah 9, verse 30. Yet many years didst thou forbear them, and testified against them by thy spirit in thy prophets. He's talking about God. He's telling telling that God forbear them. He testified against them where? By thy spirit in thy prophets, yet would they not give here? Therefore gavest thou them into the hand of the people of the lands. You see, God bore testimony to the people, and he did it by his spirit in the prophets. So the Holy Spirit didn't just come down in a fog and fill up the room. Okay, He came into, the, he came into some people. And that's what's happening, and those and the prophets then bear the testimony to the nations. And that's what's going on in Acts 7 back here, is, is that, and actually really in Acts 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and 7, the Holy Ghost has filled up that little flock, and that they're out there being the witness, and then the nation in Acts 7 comes along and blasphemes against God, against the Holy Spirit, and again, three strikes and you're out. They killed John the Baptist, sent by the Father. They killed the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son, and now they kill Stephen. And they're ready for the wrath to fall on them. So when that happens, uh, come back to Matthew. Um, Actually, make it John 12, just where we've been. So the wrath is ready to fall on them, and yet instead of pouring out the wrath, He saved Saul of Tarsus on the road to Damascus. So the fall of Israel is there in Acts 7 with the stoning of Stephen. Paul was a member of that blaspheming nation there at the time. They laid their coats at Saul's feet. The young man, Saul, breathing out threatenings. He goes out and in his own testimony there in Timothy, says that he was blasphemer and so forth. So he was a part of that nation that had no chance for forgiveness. But now, today, because of the age of grace, there really is, he's the minister, he's the apostle, 
He's everything. And, you know, really the only, unpar- only sin a person can commit today that would make all sins unpardonable is that issue of unbelief. That's it. Die- if someone dies without the Lord Jesus Christ, again, unbelief is, it's not the unpardonable sin, but yet, you know, you don't get anywhere unless you believe. And that's the issue. Look, look at Notice John 12 here, uh, a passage here that we've been over before. Verse 37, But thou, John 12, 37, but, but though he had done so many miracles before them, yet they believed not on him. That the saying of Isaiah, Isaiah, the prophet might be fulfilled, which he spake, Lord, who hath believed our report? And to whom hath the arm of the Lord been revealed? Jesus Christ is preaching to the nation of Israel out there. He's been going at them. He's been talking to them up to up to chapter 12 here. He's been preaching to them in Matthew chapter 12. He's been doing. He's been showing them miracles and all the stuff in chapter four, five, six, seven, all the way up to chapter. And yet they don't believe on him. I have written down verse 39, Therefore they could not believe, because that Isaiah said again, He hath blinded their eyes and hardened their hearts. See, there. He had blinded their eyes and hardened their hearts, that they should not see with their eyes, nor understand with their heart, and be converted, and I should heal them. And the thing that happens there is they go, Oh, see, look, he's hardened their hearts and blinded their eyes. Well, come back to Proverbs 29. A verse that often gets forgotten. I have it written down by this verse, so I don't forget it. <laughs> Proverbs 29 and verse number 1. Because when he talks here, and where we're at in Matthew 12, this is really the con- where we're at. Matthew, uh, Proverbs 29, 1. He that being often, often reproved, hardened his neck, shall suddenly be destroyed, and that without remedy. Isn't that interesting? Where does the hard neck where does the hardening of the neck come from? It comes from off being often reproved. It comes from it comes from them constantly seeing what's going on and they don't believe him. Come back to Matthew 12. So from the point where we're at here in Matthew 12 Really, from Matthew 13 down to the end of the chap, end of the book, we're going to see that he's that that nation has been blinded because he's constantly gone over this over. He's done the miracles after miracles after miracles with them, and they still don't believe. They did it ignorantly and in unbelief. So they kill the the Savior, the Lord. So what does he say? Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. He blinded them. They don't understand. They don't get it. They've refused it over and over and over. And, over. and it's, that's where the hardness has come from. So when we come here to Matthew 12, what, and by the way, that's why he says what he says in verse 31 and 32 there about blaspheming against the Holy Spirit because they're not going to believe it. When he's gone and that little flock gets to working, they're going to not believe it. He's going to give them a renewed opportunity in the Acts ministry, and they're not going to get it. They're just going to complete, keep going on and on. And that, when we finish out the chapter 12 and we start in chapter 13, that issue of blaspheming the Holy Spirit is going to come up, and it's going to creep up. Because they're going to go and kill the son. And it's going to be forgiven them because God's blinded them so that they would kill him. If they believed who he was, they weren't going to crucify him. They would have stayed away. But because he kept, boom, this is who I am, it's who I am. And again, I'll remind you, Matthew 12 happens all on the Sabbath day. So they're not happy with him. They're going to kill him, but yet God hardened their heart. Much reproof. Man, that Proverbs 29.1 helps to clarify this because they're going to, they're in their unbelief are going to go and crucify the Messiah. 
But then when Pentecost comes and the Holy Spirit comes, he's going to give that nation that renewed opportunity. No longer are they going to be uh, accused of murder. Actually, in Acts 3, Peter changes it to manslaughter again. Okay? He, he's, he's told them that by wicked hands you crucified. But now they're going to renewed opportunity. They get a chance to flee to Christ for refuge, for salvation, for protection. And yet, what do they do? They go up there and they kill Stephen in that crescendo, climactic event that says, we don't want you, God. We don't want you, the Lord Jesus Christ. Get out of here. So when you come to Matthew 12, verse 33 now, either make the tree good and his fruit good, or, or else make the tree corrupt and his fruit corrupt. For the tree is known by his fruit. Now this is where the by their works you shall know them mess comes from. You guys, are, you guys are bringing forth fruit, but they're not bringing forth the right fruit. You need to be bringing forth that fruit that John asked you for, which is the fruit of righteousness. You need to be doing that, and you're not. Verse 34, O generation of vipers, uh-oh, how can ye, being evil, speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart is the mouth speaketh. And notice he calls them a generation of vipers. And by the way, that's the estimation of the Lord here about the condition of Israel at this time back there when he's talking to them. If you come over to chapter 23, chapter 23 of Matthew, he's going to say it similar. Well, he's going to say it to them again. Matthew 23, 31. Matthew 23. 2331, wherefore ye be witnesses unto yourselves, that ye are, excuse me, are the children of them which killed the prophets. Fill ye up then the measure of your fathers, ye serpents, ye generation of vipers. How can ye escape the damnation of hell? Again, that's pretty tough. That's the estimation there. Now come over to Acts 3 and watch Peter now. In Acts 3, Peter's going to change their, this description. Acts chapter 3, verse 25. Again, pretty tough language back there with the Lord with them. And people think about the Lord being soft and easygoing and laid back. Now he, he hated the religion, and hate's not the right word. He despised the religious leaders because he knew what they were. What are they? A generation of vipers. Acts 3, verse 25, watch Peter. Ye are. So who? Ye are the children of the prophets and of the covenant which God made with our fathers, saying unto Abraham, and in thy seed shall all the kindreds of the earth be blessed. They have, Peter is literally laying out to the Sanhedrin there, to the council, to the people of Israel, a renewed opportunity of repentance and restoration is being extended to them. And yet, by the time you get to the end of the book, go run down there to Acts 28, over to Acts 28. The, <laughs> Verse 3, And when Paul had gathered a bundle of sticks and laid them on the fire, there came a viper out of the heat and fastened on his hand. And when the barbarians saw the venomous beast hang on his hands, they said among themselves, No doubt this man is a murderer, whom, though he hath escaped the sea, yet vengeance suffereth not to live. See, that's that old, you, you, karma's going to get you. And he shook off the beast into the fire and felt no harm. Notice that. A viper and the fire. You know, you got those guys, you got Mark 16, where they can handle snakes. And he gives them that instructions about the tribulation and what they're going to be able to do. By the way, the handling of the snakes there in Mark 16, 
They won't get hurt by it. That runs you back, just as speaking in tongues in Acts 2 runs you back to Genesis 11. This stuff about the viper and, and everything runs you back to Mark 16, takes you back to Exodus 4, where Moses laid down the big snake and was standing there on Pharaoh's court. And one of the signs that he was giving to the people was that issue of being able to take up the serpent. So when the apostles, Mark 16, are ready, and they're going to go work now out amongst the people, he says, hey, look, you're going to be able to have a little typology here because you're going to have to deal with some serpents, Caesar, Rome, the Jewish leadership, okay, the politicians of the day. But now with Paul, look at that, is, that serpent, the viper there in verse 3, is a type of Israel, Acts 28, 3. He's got to go out there and deal with, that is, with Israel. Then he shakes it off there in verse 5 into the fire, the type of judgment. So when you have that, that thing over there in 1 Thessalonians 2, where he says, forbidding us to speak to the Gentiles, 1 Thessalonians 2, verse 16, you can get it right. 2, 16, forbidding us to speak to the Gentiles, that they might be saved to fill up their sins always. For the wrath is come upon them to the uttermost. And what you're reading in Acts 28, go back there to Acts 28 again, is you're reading a picture of that. You're in type. Paul goes over, put, builds in, does some things, gets bit by a snake. Acts 28, 28. Be it known, therefore, unto you that, salvate, that the salvation of God is sent unto the Gentiles, and that they will hear it. And when he had said these words, the Jews departed and had great reasoning among themselves. Illustration of the nation of Israel being cast off into the fire, and the Gentiles now be, come back to Matthew 12, onto the scene. So what you're having in Matthew 12, with that old generation of vipers term, is you're begin, you're, you're, you are literally seeing the fall and the diminishing of Israel right here. That's why the old-time guys used to say the fall of Israel happens here in Matthew 12 and 13. Because they have literally, he's going to literally, well, we'll get there. I'm ahead of myself a little bit. But that's what's happening here. They are, bla they're going to blaspheme the Holy Spirit. They're going to do all of this stuff, and they're just stepping off the, the cliff. Verse 35. A good man out of a good out of the good treasure of the heart bringeth forth good things, and an evil man out of the evil treasure bringeth forth evil things. But I say unto you that every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give account thereof in the day of judgment. For by thy words thou shalt be justified, and by thy words thou shalt be condemned. That's a, a lot of practical things in that passage. But that issue about the idle word, what a man speaketh, they're going to do what? They're going to give an account in the day of judgment. That's interesting there. Because back up there in verse 32, he speaketh a word against the son, forgiven, but not that, that idle word. And, and you know, it's an interesting thing. I've got a book I've been reading about the things that we say and phrases that we use and how they come out of the Scripture. It's a big old, big old thick thing like that. I found it online, I printed it, and then I found it in print, so I bought the book. And then the binding broke on it, so I trimmed it up and put it in a three-ring binder because <laughs> I, I keep hold on to it. What's going on here? Back to Matthew 12, idle word. Hey, you better be careful the words you guys are using because it'll condemn you. Verse 38, then certain of the scribes and of the Pharisees answered saying, Master, we would see a sign from thee. We want to see you do a sign. But he answered and said unto them, an evil and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign. 
and there shall no sign be given to it but the sign of the prophet Jonah, Jonas. Now, notice this issue here. They ask him for a sign. He, well, why didn't he give him a sign? He's been giving him a sign since chapter 4. All along, chapter 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, and 12 here. They're, and they didn't believe any of them. And again, much reproof hardeneth the neck. He's been pounding them with the message and with the sign to back the message up. Here's a message. Here's the sign. Here's the sign. You know, like what's his name? Here's your sign type thing. And again, if you look, I mean, he's been doing it all along. But if you look back up verse 22, then was brought unto him one possessed with the devil, blind and dumb. He healed him in his smokes that the blind and the dumb both spake. And, say, and the people see it. They see what's going on. They got it. But the Pharisees didn't get it. Back up in verse 13. Then said he to the man, Stretch forth thine hand, and he stretched it forth, and it was restored hold like as the other. Then the Pharisees went out and held counsel against him, how they might destroy him. See how they didn't go out and say, Here he is, here's our Messiah. Rather, they went out to try to figure out how to kill him. So back over here in verse 39, Jesus says, No, guys, no more signs. I'm not going to give you another sign. The only sign that you're going to get now is the sign of the prophet Jonah. Verse 40, For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Isn't that interesting? The, the, come over to chapter 16. The only thing that you guys are going to get now is Calvary. That's where he's pointing to. Matthew 16. Look at Matthew 16, verse 1. Then the Pharisees also with the Sadducees came and tempted, tempting, desiring, desired him that he would show them a sign from heaven. He answered and said unto them, When it is even, ye say, it will be fair weather. For the sky is red. And in the morning it will be foul weather today, for the sky is red and lowering. Oh, ye hypocrites, ye can discern the face of the sky, but can ye not discern the signs of the times? Man, you guys can tell if it's going to be a good day, a bad day, by looking out there at the sky and the clouds, but don't, you guys have. No spiritual perception of when you see the signs of the times. And now the signs of the times here are what Christ is doing in their midst. Healing the sick, cleansing the leper, raising the dead. Those signs that demonstrated that he was the Messiah and that God had come to them. Their Messiah, their king, their prophet, their priest, their redeemer was there. And it was time to receive him. A wicked and adulterous generation seeketh after another, a sign. And there shall no sign be given unto it, but the sign of the prophet Jonah, and he left them and departed. Now the sign of the prophet of Jonah is going to be important. Come back over there to chapter 12. Okay? And this thing here now about the sign of the... Jo the only thing that Christ promised them was that the sign that's coming is going to give them a new opportunity. And he said this again to a bunch of people back here that have stiffened their neck. They're an adulterous and a wicked generation. They've come along now and they've seen everything and they give me some give me one more. And he says, no, nope, the only sign left for you guys is that the, that sign of the prophet Jonah. Now the reason that the prophet Jonah sign is what's going to be given is because Jonah is a type of the nation of Israel. Now what did Jonah do? Well, Jonah is told, to go down there to that Gentile town, Nineveh. And he said, no, <laughs> I won't go. 
So he runs down there, runs away, and gets down on the seashore down there, and the, old, and the whale gets him, right? You know, you know the story, Jonah 1, Jonah 2, Jonah, okay? And uh, he, he's... He's out, and again, the whale thing, a type of tribulation. He gets taken down into hell. By the way, it was a whale, okay? I know sometimes people get off and they see sea monster or dragon or all this stuff. No, it, it was a whale. It's a great fish, actually, in Jonah. Jonah is three days and three nights, and in Jonah 2, he's in hell, so Jonah died. He wasn't alive. Now, I know... and. There's been stories of people who were alive back in the whaling days and all that stuff, and that's fine. But here, he's in that whale's belly three days and three nights. He goes down. He dies. He's sent to hell. And then about three days and three nights later, the whale gets an upset stomach and spits him back out onto the, sea, onto the beach there. And... Uh, he got up and went into Nineveh, and the whole town repented. But he was there for three days and three nights. And we'll come back and talk about, about that, because that is a reversal of the timekeeping based on Israel. Israel was a night and a day makes the day, a night and a morning. Here he flipped it on its head, and we'll look at that next time. I want to finish the chapter if we can. Verse 40. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The men of Nineveh shall rise in judgment with this generation and shall condemn it. You see that, e that evil and adulterous generation, right, is a, just a, simply a bunch of unbelievers. And the men of Nineveh who repented, they're going to rise in judgment. They're going to condemn this because they repented at the preaching of Jonah. And behold, a greater than Jonah, Jonas is here. You see, the men of Nineveh, they heard one sermon. They didn't see any miracles. They believed. They repented. You guys, and you think about the Gentiles in Nineveh, those dumb, ignorant dogs of Gentiles in Nineveh, they had literally had more sense to recognize the word of God from the prophet Jonah than sitting right here in front of him as the nation of Israel who have the oracles of God, who know God's word. They have the greater than the prophet sitting in front of them They've already seen that he's the greater priest. Now he is the greater than the prophet here, and they ignore him. They reject him. So Nineveh, they're going to show up, and they're going to rise in judgment. Verse 42, the queen of the south shall rise up in judgment with this generation and shall condemn it, for she came from the utmost parts of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon. And behold, a greater than Solomon, the king, is here. So, who is the queen of south? That's Queen of Sheba, another Gentile. You see, the, the, those poor, ignorant, dumb, dirty, dog Gentiles had understood the wisdom of God, understood the wisdom of God in His Word, whether it was by the prophet or by the king, Solomon or Jonah, they understood it better than the beloved people, the favored nation of Israel. And in their midst, in Israel's midst, stands the greater than the prophet, the king. He's sitting there, He's done signs and miracles just to confirm to them what he was doing and who he was. And yet the nation of Israel rejected him, refused to hear him out, refused to believe him, so, he, so they are going to be condemned. Verse 43. 
when the unclean spirit is gone out of a man, he walketh through dry places seeking rest and findeth none. Now, from here down, this thing about the unclean spirit, he's going to give an illustration that's going to represent the judgment of God on the nation of Israel. And again, this is why the old time, you know, dispensational guys, the Schofield type, okay, say that this is where the fall of Israel happens because you're going to see the judgment of God here now. Verse 44, then he saith, I will return into my house from whence I came out. And when he has come, he findeth it empty, swept, and garnished, clean completely out. Then goeth he and taketh with himself seven other spirits more wicked than himself. And they enter in and dwell there. And the last state of that man is worse than the first. Even so shall it be also unto this wicked generation. The illustration here. The Lord is applying it to the generation that is evil and it's wicked. And he's talking about that apostate generation here in Israel. Now you'll notice the man in verse 43. Out of whom the unclean spirits are gone is the wicked generation. And he says that when those unclean spirits go out, they have been removed. I'm, I'm here, I've removed them. They go, look, they go traveling around for a while, but they come back to the guy's house. They find it empty. That unclean spirit goes in, goes out, gets seven more, worse than him, <laughs> comes back in, Moves, they move back in, and the latter is worse than the former. Now, what that is is an illustration to, of the result of Israel missing the opportunity that was being presented to them at the time by the Lord. The nation of Israel is a type of a house, of that house. And actually, literally, Israel is haunted by evil spirits. And we saw this when we studied Luke and, and and all of the demonic possession. He comes in, the Lord comes in, cleans them out, gives them an opportunity to receive their king, their prophet, their priest, gives them an opportunity to, to be saved, to get saved, salvation, to receive their blessing. They won't do it. Everything is ready. He's cleaned it. He's garnished it. Everything is ready to receive their guest, the Lord Jesus Christ, their Messiah. They don't receive him. The man's house is empty. It didn't have the guest that should have been invited in, the Lord Jesus Christ. And the result is that the latter is worse than the former. The result is that Israel literally becomes a haunted house. And uh, they could have been a house that had the Lord in it. They could have been the nation that the Lord had set up for them to be. But rather, they just came along and rejected Him. They missed the opportunity. Now, they're going to... He, he, the, you know, the Lord's going to give them a renewed opportunity in the Acts period. Okay? And if you miss that one, he says, then you're done. And that's literally being, being the latter is worse than the first. So the Lord, in the first comes through, cleans them out, leaves them all ready to, to receive in the guest. They reject him. They're going to reach over now in the Acts period and blaspheme the Holy Spirit so it's going to be worse than the first. And that issue of the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit that's going to come on, in, come on them in Acts there is going to be, well, no forgiveness, no forgiveness, no forgiveness. So hopefully you see the illustration here. Nineveh got it. The Queen of Sheba got it. And because they got it, they're all going to rise up at the great white throne judgment over there 
And they're going to testify against the, the nation of Israel, the people that are there. By the way, if you look there in verse 41 and 42, there is a resurrection there of the Gentile folks that will happen at the same time that those Old Testament saints are resurrected into the kingdom. I said it Sunday I'm on the board. The Old Testament saints, the Gentile saints, because there are Gentile believers all through the Old Testament time period that we never really read about in Scripture. They're going to get resurrected, and there's going to be a bunch of wailing and gnashing of teeth when they sit there and they see a bunch of Gentiles walking on into the kingdom, and they're on the outside going, hey, what, ha what is this? And it's going to be a tough period. All right, back to Matthew 12. Verse 46, Matthew 12, 46. <clears throat> Let me see here. Matthew 12, verse 46. While he yet talked to the people, behold, his mother and his brethren stood without, desiring to speak with him. Then one said unto him, Behold, thy mother and thy brethren stand without, desiring to speak unto thee. But he answered and said unto him that told him, Who is my mother, and who are my brethren? And he stretched forth his hand toward his disciples and said, Behold, my mother and my brethren. Now, he's, here he's talking to the little flock. He's talking to the disciples, the little flock there. For whosoever shall do the will of my Father which is in heaven, the same is my brother and sister and mother. Now notice what he just did. Like he said already back in Matthew 5, we read down through there, whosoever does the will of my father, guess what they are? You see his mom, come back there to Matthew 5, just so you see this, Matthew 5. Well, just let it go because of the time. Matthew 12 here. This is a place, again, where they say, see, the Israel has fallen. Because he just publicly broke ranks. He just publicly broke the bands that naturally connected, naturally con existed between him and the earthly people, Israel, his mother and his brother, and he breaks that band, and he acknowledged only those who were his by faith, by doing the will of the Father, keeping the pattern of the Sermon on the Mount, if you will. Okay? So that's why people read this and say, see, the fall of Israel happened right there. Come over to Matthew 21. See, look, it happened right there. Now, this is not the fall of Israel. We know that today. But if you look at Matthew 21, this is what is happening in Matthew 12. Here's what's happening in Matthew 21, verse 43. Okay? When he says, hey, my mom, who's my mom? Who's my brother? He's not talking about Mary and his siblings. Okay? Or uh, his brothers and sisters, siblings, yeah, siblings. <laughs> He's talking about the relationship with the nation out there. Because the siblings are going to come around, if you remember. Has have, James is there, and Mary's never really left him. She knew who he was. She was part of the little flock. So it was not a physical, you know, there's mom, kick, kick mom to the curb. He actually, from the cross, is looking out for Mary and says to John, 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 Mary, you guys take care of each other, <laughs> you know. But here's what was happening in Matthew 12, the end here, verse 43. Therefore say I unto you, the Lord talking to the Pharisees, the kingdom of God shall be taken from you and given to a nation bringing forth the fruits thereof. That's what's happening in Matthew 12. Not the fall of Israel, 
but rather the, the removing of the kingdom from the nation of Israel as a whole, that apostate nation, and giving it to the little flock specifically. So you have the nation of Israel out there. You got that little flock going on inside. Come over to John 1. He's been, he's been gathering them. He's been forming them. He, he's in John 1, 11 and 12, where we spent you know, several years in the book of John. John 1, 11, he came unto his own, and his own received him not. There he is. Where, who's my brother? Who's my mom? None of those people are not. But as many as received him to them, the, the people who follow the will of the Father and obey my word and are following me, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. They're the ones to whom the kingdom, to whom all the stuff is going to be centered around. So when you come back to Matthew 12 here, you don't see the fall of Israel. What you see is God taking the kingdom promises and blessings away from the apostate nation and then giving it to a nation, that little flock, that believing remnant. So that's really what's happening here in Matthew 12. Look, if you will, at chapter 13 and verse 1. Now we'll pick up in 13 here, but I just want you to see the same day went Jesus out of the house and sat by the sea. Now come over to chapter 23 again. Chapter 23. Chapter 23 and 38. Chapter tw chapter Matthew 23, 38. Behold, your house is left unto you desolate. Your house, the desolate so what he's doing here, starting in Matthew 13, all the way down here, 24, he's going to give the second Olivet Discourse, they call it, and then he's going to go to Calvary. He's leaving that temple that is part of the nation of Israel. He goes out of that temp temp temple, the house, Israel. He says, that house is not my house anymore. You remember one time, what did you say about what they were doing to his father's house? Desecrating it. And now he says, your house is left desolate. He's leaving. He's left the nation. And from 13 on down now, he's going to withdraw completely out of that apostate nation. He has to deal with them here and there. But now he's going to focus in on that little remnant. And in starting in Matthew 13, he's going to lay out the issues of the parable of the kingdom, the mysteries of the kingdom, as he begins now to educate that new nation, that believing remnant, the, the true nation, the, exact, the true Israel of God, as Paul calls it in Galatians 6, so that they are ready to bring forth the fruits that they're to bring forth and they're to move forth. So, We'll start in Matthew 13 next time as he goes down through here. And again, these mystery parables of the kingdom and so forth. The, he's going to tell you why he speaks in. He's going to give a parable. He's going to tell you why he's speaking the parable, give you a parable, give you another parable. And then he's going to explain those two parables so you can understand what all the other parables are about and how to educate and go through. Okay? All right. <clears throat> Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the evening, Lord. We thank you for your word. And above all, we thank you for everything that we have in you. For the instructions here to see how you came to your people and came into your own and your own received you not. And Lord, we just thank you for that instruction, for the insight and to look at it. And we'll just give you the praise and the honor and the glory. In your name we pray. Amen. <laughs>